in the last episode of Lest We Forget. William Miller was not born here. He was born February 15, 1782, down in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. His father, whose name was also William Miller, was a veteran of the American Revolution. And his mother, Paulina Phelps, was the daughter of a Baptist minister. When William, let's call him Bill, just to keep father and son separate as long as the father is alive. So we'll refer to him Bill at this point, which I think he was known as actually, from what I can tell as a young man. So when Bill was about four years of age, the family moved up here to this spot down on the corner, except they moved into a log cabin. It was not the house that you saw now, that would come later, but it was a log cabin initially. And uh, eventually there would be 16 children in the Miller family. One place, the beginning of a story, three books, a boy who learned to read with the Bible and grew up to be a man thirsting for all kinds of knowledge. And he especially enjoyed studying history, having no idea at this point that this is going to be something that will be valuable for him in the future. He also began to read the uh, skeptical, deistic writings of men like Voltaire, David Hume, Thomas Paine, Ethan Allen, and Miller, seeing himself as a budding intellectual, becomes a skeptic, a deist. A man summoned to a battle that would change the course of a country as it struggled for its very existence. The president called for men to come to defend the honor of the country against what the British had been doing to our sailors and impressing them into the British Navy and some other issues because that was one of the big ones. And if you're the son of a patriot and the president calls for you to come defend the honor of their country, what are you going to do? You're going to volunteer. What is the fate of Captain William Miller and his soldiers at the Battle of Plattsburgh? How would this event forever change not only the history of the United States of America, but that man as well? That is what we're going to find out in this second episode of Lest We Forget. things that can cause us to question our faith. An emotional crisis, skeptical intellectual arguments, or a general disinterest in spiritual things. These doubts can take hold and seem to have the upper hand for years. But sometimes there are events that happen that shake all our doubts to their core. Today, as we continue to explore the story of William Miller, he is about to take part in the Battle of Plattsburgh as he faces almost certain destruction at the hands of the vastly superior British Army. The Battle of Plattsburgh was the crucial, or one of the crucial battles in the War of 1812. What's going on? Now, remember, Miller is stationed up there. He is a deist. He does not believe that God is in charge of anything. He doesn't believe there's any answer to prayer or anything else. In fact, he writes to a friend just before the battle, and he expresses to this a friend that he thinks he's going to die probably in this battle, but that he's going to fight like a man. He is committed to defending the country. Two completely different armies. As the Battle of Plattsburgh approached, there was an obvious inequality between the opponents. And thinking logically, 
it was very clear who would emerge victorious. The British advantage overwhelmingly outweighed any American hope of winning the battle. The British are going to win. The English are going to win. Of course, that's who. And that's why Miller goes into this battle thinking they're going to win. So down comes the British fleet. Now in Plattsburgh, it's interesting because there is a, a, a piece of land that juts out into the lake, kind of goes out with a hook on the end of it. And the American, Captain McDunn, who was in charge of the naval fleet, we had land forces and a few little boats that we called the Navy. Um, they were anchored right off the backside, the underside of that hook. And of course, they didn't have all the telecommunications they have today, so the British weren't quite sure where this uh, battle might happen. So when the British come down with better built ships, by the time they realize that the Americans are hiding behind this point out there, the Americans are going bang, 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 and the British are trying to get organized to come bang, 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 back, you know? And um, Captain McDunn, I don't know anything about how you do this, but uh, the reports are he had, there's a way of anchoring your ships and you could turn them around fairly rapidly. So he could turn them around and he had all the cannons on the other side ready to go. And so bang, 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 bang. And here come the British are out there and they can't get turned around so fast because they weren't all organized ahead of time. And before long, within an hour or two, what ships had not found their way to the bottom of Lake Champlain, the British ships, had struck their colors to, quotes the American Navy. The Americans were ecstatic. They never expected to win. They had no idea they would win. They could not believe it. William Miller wrote home to the same friend that he'd written to a few days before, knowing that there was a battle coming, thinking that he was going to die. Now he writes and he says, huzzah, huzzah, I found I'm a man, I can fight. I mean, he's all excited. This was, this was a very patriotic time for Americans because they had defeated the British. In fact, this battle, the reason I say it's crucial is because when word got to the ones that were trying to negotiate in Europe, in Ghent, about ending this war, when the word reached them that the British Navy had lost here, they went ahead and signed the surrender papers. Now, of course, communication was so slow that the word didn't get back to the commanding officer of the British down in Louisiana, New Orleans. So we had another big battle down there, and we had a very famous general who later became President of the United States, Andrew Jackson, and his, even though he won the battle, it made no difference because the peace treaty had already been signed before the battle was fought, but they didn't know it. Um, so that's the state of communication has changed. But anyway, this is a crucial battle. The war was over, and with it, the service of Captain Miller, who had served his country so faithfully. The following year, after his discharge from the army, Miller returns home. With the death of his father, he begins to take care of family matters and buys a farm so his mother has a pleasant place to live. Soon after, he also builds his own home, where he would live until the end of his life. Now, at this point, he is still a deist, but he is beginning to wonder about things that are going on. Things that happened even in the Battle of Plattsburgh. During the Battle of Plattsburgh that he'd just been through, among other things, a shell landed about a meter from where Miller was standing. Here is the kind of shell probably it was. This is from the Battle of Plattsburgh. The shell landed and it exploded and fragments went every which way and Miller is not even touched. He's not hurt, but he has seen other people die in the Battle of Plattsburgh. The blood apparently was running thick on the ships from the descriptions, if you read the descriptions of the battle but he is not even hurt. He's beginning to wonder. Thoughts are going through his mind as he's here now afterwards. Could it be, really? Could it really be that there is a God who looks after the affairs of nations? And he's, these thoughts are beginning to go through his mind. Now, he's not yet converted, okay? But he is beginning to think about it. He's thinking about the men he saw died, blown, uh, that, who died, and were blown to pieces and all this. And he says, he writes later, he's thinking, annihilation. Annihilation was a cold and chilling thought. The heavens were as brass over my head, and the earth as iron under my feet. Eternity 
What was it? Death and death. Why was it? These thoughts, the Holy Spirit's beginning to move in on his mind at this period of time. During this period of time, as William Miller was being reunited with his family and returning to social life, he started to attend the Baptist church where his uncle was the pastor. Although his father was a man without faith, he had a brother who was a Baptist minister. At this time in his life, William was still a deist, but he started attending this church on some Sundays. And though certain concerns were already rising in his heart, he was still far from being the type of person to pray. But what he did not realize is that learning to read the Bible as a young man and just knowing how to read well would soon change the direction of his life. So he would go to church there on occasion, but not always. One time his mother noticed, I remember she's living down the corner. She's a widow by this time, but she noticed that some Sundays her son was in church and some Sundays he was not in church. And so she asked him, now what is, what's kind of going on with you? Some Sundays you come to church. Some Sundays you don't come to church. Why? Well, he said, you know, mother, when Uncle Elihu is there, so when he's not there, why they had a series of books of sermons. And one of the local deacons would choose a sermon from one of those books and then someone would get up and try to read it. And apparently they could not read very well, and so they kind of uh, 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 all the way through it. And it drove Miller up a wall. He couldn't stand it, and he didn't believe it anyway. So why bother to go to church? So he said to Mother, when Uncle Elihu is there, I'm always present. But when he's not, I just stay home. Well, he then added something that he should not have added. Well, he, he should have added. He did add, but maybe he thought at the time he shouldn't have added. He said to his mother, you know, if when Uncle Elihu is not present, they would ask me to read the sermon. I'd always be present. If any mother who's worth her salt is going to take care of things, she's going to talk to the deacons to make certain that from then on, anytime her brother-in-law is not there in church, guess who gets asked to read the sermon? William Miller. That's how he happened to be there on the Sunday closest to the second anniversary of the Battle of Plattsburgh. Now, remember also that this is a very patriotic time, that there are people, I mean, there's celebrations and stuff still going on, but on this Sunday, he's in church. And there was a sermon that was written by this man, it was in the Book of Sermons, Alexander Proudfit. And Miller tells us that somewhere in the middle of that sermon, he broke down and began to weep. He could not complete the sermon. The story doesn't tell us. I assume he had to hand the book to one of those people that he despised hearing, and they stammered and stuttered their way through the rest of the sermon. Now, what was it in the sermon that got to Miller? He doesn't tell us, so I can't tell you for certain, but having read the sermon, I can imagine what it was. I mean, at least I'm gonna take a, a guess. When you read through the sermon on how you should raise your children in the fear of God, it is considerably different than the way at least Americans are raising their children today. That, believe me, because the discipline and all is different. But there are two places in the sermon where proud fit moves in on the reader or the hearer. One place, he moves in. He says, if you want your children to believe, you must believe. If you want them to believe in God, you must believe in God. If you want them to believe in the power of prayer, you must believe in prayer. He moves in, comes back out, talks about some more stuff, he moves back in and makes that point a second time in the sermon. My guess is, as I told you, Miller doesn't tell us where, where he broke down and started to cry or weep, but I'm assuming it's one of those two places. Why? Because Miller knew he's sitting there, he's been a rational, logical thinking deist, and he realized the inconsistency of his life. He's going through the motions, but he doesn't believe a bit of it. And I think that's where the Holy Spirit tripped him up. It may not be, it may be somewhere else. Um, you can read the sermon sometime if you want and come to your own conclusion, but that's what I have concluded after reading the sermon. Anyway, he now begins a change in his life. The, uh, here's what he says, uh, here's what he wrote later. Suddenly, he said, 
Suddenly, the character of a Savior was vividly impressed upon my mind. It seemed that there might be a being so good and compassionate as to himself atone for our transgressions and thereby save us from suffering the penalty of sin. Now, for the first time in his life, he's going to begin studying his Bible. He wants to know what kind of a God is revealed in Scripture. And uh, you all are historians, or most of you, you know what his method of Bible study was. Well, he started with Genesis 1.1 and he begins to read through the Bible. He has no commentaries at this point. He'll have them later in his life, but he has no commentaries. He has a Cruden's Concordance. His question, what kind of a God is revealed in Scripture? That's where he's at in this point in his experience. When he comes to a word that he does not know the meaning of, he doesn't go to the dictionary. Instead, he goes to the Concordance. He looks up every other place in the Bible where that word is used, and he keeps moving forward. Sometime during the period from 1816 to 1818, he comes across the text that forever he will be uh, linked with uh, yeah, in his life, the rest of his life, and that is unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And I can picture him uh, saying to himself, sanctuary, sanctuary, and looking up all the different definitions of sanctuary. You know, there's a heavenly sanctuary, and the earth's a sanctuary, and the body's a sanctuary, and there's all these different things. And in his mind, he cannot believe that there's anything in heaven that needs to be cleansed. So he makes this fatal mistake. And he concludes, because of his study of the prophecies, and I mean of history earlier, that he concludes from the prophecies that they're going to end about the year 1843. Through Bible study, William Miller begins to connect the dots between passages in various parts of Scripture. When reading Daniel 8.14, he reads, Unto two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Through his own process of elimination, he concluded that the earth was the sanctuary to be cleansed. He interpreted the biblical text as stating that at the end of the twenty-three hundred days, the earth would be purified, that is, that Jesus would return. But when would these 2300 days be fulfilled? Based on the biblical explanation of Ezekiel 4 verse 7 and Numbers 14 verse 34, he understood that prophetically a day in Bible prophecy symbolized a year in literal time. That is, for Miller, Daniel 8.14 stated that 2300 years from the start of the prophecy, Jesus would return. But when should this count start? According to Daniel 9.24, there is a count of 70 weeks, a shorter time period included in the 2300-day prophecy. As a week has seven days, 70 weeks results in 490 days, which prophetically means 490 years. This prophecy indicated that the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem would launch the time prophecy. This comprehensive decree was recorded in Ezra 7 as being given by King Artaxerxes in 457 BC. Upon reaching this milestone, Miller subtracted the initial 457 years from the 2300 years of the sanctuary cleansing prophecy and reached the year 1843 as the time when Jesus would return. He is so amazed. He cannot believe it. He said, I saw that the Bible did bring to view just such a savior as I needed. And I was perplexed to find how an uninspired book should develop principles so perfectly adapted to the wants of a fallen world. I was constrained, he went on to say, or forced. I was forced. I was constrained to admit that the scriptures must be a revelation from God. They became my delight. And in Jesus, I found a friend. That describes the rest of Miller's life. The Bible now became my chief study, and I can say I searched it with great delight, he would go on to say. So he's there studying, and he comes to this text that under 2,300 days that shall the sanctuary be cleansed, and he's thinking to himself, sanctuary, sanctuary. And as I just said, he could not conceive of anything in heaven that needed to be cleansed. He didn't understand that. And so he concludes it has to be the earth that's going to be cleansed by fire when Jesus returns. 
he thinks to himself, my new best friend will be coming back to Earth. This is about 1818. Or coming back to Earth in about 25 years? I can't be. I, I'm just a farmer. Nobody's preaching this. I, I, this is wrong. I, I mean, I, 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 it seems right, but it's wrong. I mean, what's going on? And so for the next five years, he studies and restudies the Bible prophecies at all involved. And by 1823, he's even more convinced than he was in 1818 when he came to the discovery that the world as he understood it was about to be consumed by fire when Jesus came to get the saints and take them home. Now he has a problem. If you are convinced or convicted of Bible truth, and you are not willing to share it, that's a terrible conflict to have. And that's the conflict that he is under at this point in time. Well, there is a story that comes down from this era. He's not willing to do any public work yet, but there is a famous story, and since it happened here over in the house, not right in the chapel, but we should probably talk about it here. There was a... Um, well, Miller had a, one of his children, we don't know which one, who became ill. And so Miller sent for a physician to come and uh, examine and treat the child. And the old story tells us that when the doctor is ready to leave the house, why Miller is sitting there by the door and he's looking very despondent and very down. And the doctor looks at him and he says to him, uh, Esquire Miller, Miller was a justice of the peace, so he was called Esquire. Is there something wrong with you today? Is something bothering you? Are you not feeling well? Well, Miller said, I, I don't know. And he held out his wrist so the doctor could take his pulse. And uh, the doctor takes the pulse and said, seems good to me, what's wrong? Well, how are you feeling, what's going on? Now this doctor had been going around the neighborhood saying we all like Miller. But when you get him started on the prophecies, he's a monomaniac. So Miller's a good guy, except if you get him going on the prophecies, then he's a monomaniac. So Miller's heard this about this doctor, and now the doctor's here. Is there something wrong with you? Pulse is okay? Well, Miller says, I don't know, doctor. Could it be possible that, that I'm a monomaniac? Now, the story seems to imply that the doctor turned all colors of the rainbow, but Miller was not the type to let you off easily once he had you cornered. He kept right on going. He said, Doctor, would you know a monomaniac if you really saw one? And the doctor is stammering and stuttering, but Miller is still not going to let him off the hook. He said, I want you to examine me. I want you to discover whether I'm a monomaniac. You can charge your normal fee for giving the examination. Now, what did Miller know? Miller knew there was only one way that that doctor was going to find out whether or not Miller was a monomaniac on the prophecies, and that is Miller was going to have to give him a Bible study so he could really find out. And that doctor's soul was so important to Miller, he was willing to pay the doctor's fee if he could just share with that physician why. He thought his best friend, Jesus, would be returning in a few years. And the doctor couldn't get away from him, so they sat down in Miller's study and began turn the Bible, to open up Daniel 8, Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 9. All these chapters are working their way through them. And for the first time in his life, the doctor realizes it's not just mumbo-jumbo. It makes sense. And when they got through with the Bible study, the doctor jumped up, according to the old story, headed for the door. The next morning he arrives, he looks like he hasn't had a wink of sleep all night. He apparently hadn't had much sleep all night. Miller goes to the door, finds this man, and the doctor says to him, I'm a lost man. You have to study with me some more. Miller set up a course of studies to point him to the ark of safety. And at the end of the course of studies, the doctor went away rejoicing, as much a monomaniac on the prophecies as William Miller. Now that's the kind of impact Miller was having one-on-one. -on -one. He's not willing to go public yet with any kind of preaching because as he said, I'm just a farmer. Who's going to listen to me? Why would anybody listen to me at all? 
because what do they know? What do I know? I'm not trained. I'm not a, I'm not a pastor. I'm just a lay person. But God was not through with William Miller yet. So in August of 1831, is the way it's told in Sylvester Bliss's Memoirs of William Miller, which was published in 1853, Miller is studying his Bible because he's a Baptist, it's not his Sabbath, but he's studying his Bible in his study, and the Holy Spirit is moving in on him and convicting him that he should go share what he has been studying all these years, back since 1816, 1818. Now we're into 1831 or 33, whichever year you happen to accept. And he's saying, I can't go. Nobody's going to listen to me. Same argument he's used with God before. And he's still impressed that he should go tell the world. Finally, finally, he surrenders and says, if I'm ever asked to go, I will go preach. Thinking that he would never be asked, of course, to go because he'd never been asked up to this point. If to read a sermon down here, yeah, that's one thing, but to go preach. Um, he had never been asked to preach. And um, so he makes this commitment that he will go if he's asked. What a transformation. William Miller has come a long way from his deistic beginnings. Isn't it incredible how the course of a person's life can change so dramatically? To go from believing that God is not involved with the world to realizing he absolutely is to go on a journey of honestly searching the scriptures and discovering there the friend and savior that he so desperately needed. And then to come to the conviction that his friend Jesus was soon to return to the earth and that he should share it. Perhaps in your own life, it feels like your future has no hope, that there's no way out. But with God, there is always a way because he has a plan for your life. William Miller will come to experience just how incredible God's plans can be. In our next episode, William Miller's life is about to change in ways he could never have imagined, as his grudging deal with God is answered quicker than he could have ever dreamed possible. 